speaker is Leslie Crawford, who is our second speaker of the day from great schools. And she has also written for Salon.com, San Francisco Magazine, uh, Baby Center, Parenting. And you're going to be talking about parenting in a data-driven, technology-driven world. Yes. Okay. We'll get rid of that noise. Great. Okay, Leslie Crawford. So, so I'll try to make this a pretty uh, quick, quick run through. Um, very briefly, starting with the past. Um, I did want to give a little bit of credit to my son, and I think there's some irony here because um, he saw my PowerPoint presentation last night. He's 16, and he was like. So horrible and ugly. And um, I'm a bit of a, a Luddite in terms of technology, so uh, then he formed it in a half an hour just doing amazing things. So that actually gives me, um, it's encouraging that, that um, you know, the, the future people of the planet, um, whether we like it or not, run with all of the tools we have and I hope we'll make the best of them, which is sort of the theme of this. Um, and before I go into the future, um, I just wanted to briefly dip into the past because there's great relevance. Um, I would say to make a sweeping generalization from the beginning of time when humans roamed the planet until maybe the Industrial Revolution, parenting sort of was just default, you parented. You, it was really called child rearing, sort of like animal husbandry. You, um, and then in 1959, the actual phrase parenting emerged and suddenly became a gerund. It became something you consciously decided how you're going to do it. And parents ever since have been assaulted with all kinds of advice and tools to make use of. Um, here are some examples of some of maybe more questionable ones, like a, a corset for to correct all kinds of emotional and physical ills of childhood, to wear these steel rods for children. Um, the one below there is a it's sort of a baby kennel where you would put the baby outside the window to um, give them fresh air. Don't know why you don't take them out for a walk, but um, so so I'm just going to briefly touch on four kinds of parenting practices that I'm seeing are developing. And, and the, really the, the question that is unanswered is so how we're going to use these different um, tools at our disposal, which are going to jump in terms of possibilities. Um, we've touched on them with some of the other speakers, you know, in the next few decades. And, and really, it's not even a question of how we parent, but the more interesting question is, what kind of human beings are we going to raise using these tools? Are they going to be more intelligent? Are they going to have higher IQs? Are they going to have higher EQs? And I think it's just a matter of really making good use of what we have. So I'm going to just start with uh, what I'm calling remote control parenting. And this is one that raises all kinds of ethical and, and some funny questions. Um, but um, I'm also calling it high-tech duct tape parenting, um, illustrated up there. Because there's more and more possibilities as, um, I would argue, we become a little more fearful as parents. There are so many dangers out there, even though statistically kids are safer now than they have been uh, I don't know since when, but certainly since the 60s. This is a, a statistic from Lenore Skenazy, the mother who became sort of uh, instantly famous and uh, demonized for a while because she let her nine-year-old son take the subway in New York. And she wrote the book Free Range Parenting, suggesting we should let our kids, kids a little more free than we do. But she said the chance of any child being abducted and killed by a stranger is roughly one in 1.5 million. It's important to keep in mind when we have tools at our disposal to really control our kids, including um, this one right there I'm showing. 
It's called the Philip. It's a wrist-worn tracking device that kind of creates an invisible fence, so you're alerted immediately if your child goes beyond it. Um, and it, you also can hear what's going on with your children, so whether or not you want to play Big Brother with your child, or, or maybe because you're worried they're going to be abducted. It goes both ways. There's different devices like a mini break. Um, you can have front attached your child's bikes remotely, so if you think your child's in danger, you can put the brakes on. You hope not too fast. Flip over the, the front. Um, there's an interesting device uh, coming out of Japan where it you strap it onto your child's chest and um, it monitors the heart rate. So uh, worst case scenario is you your smartphone says your child's heart rate is racing. So um, it instantly takes a picture of whatever your child's encountering, the, the stranger with candy or, um, or maybe a bully. So it snaps a photo of that. Maybe your child's heart is racing because he's playing, but that's kind of a crazy idea. Um, um, and I'm sure the, the great minds in this room know more about the possibilities of microchipping children, the way, you know, uh, so we can always know where they are, and that's, that obviously raises great ethical issues. Um, another, another theme I just want to touch on is perfection parenting, and I'll really only talk about this briefly because admittedly I know so little about it, and it's even been talked about here about smart drugs for children. Uh, obviously we know about the prevalence of Ritalin. It's being given to younger and younger kids, kind of um, uh, often Ritalin is actually given to sort of the youngest kid in a class, even in kindergarten, because for the most immature, it's harder for them to sit still. So it's really just again raising the question of um, what we're giving to kids and why. And as we develop more and more truly smart drugs for kids, um, you know, uh, and we can tailor it to memory or um, certain different kinds of cognition, whether how much we want to do that with children, and it also raises issues of the haves and haves nots. The, the people who can afford smart drugs for their kids, so they do better at tests, so they can finally go to Harvard if that's your goal. Um, again, it's, it might, it might create a social divide. Um, but I guess these smart drugs, the COGS, will be so advanced parents and teachers can manipulate biology in a way and um, tailored to enhance mental f um, faculties like memory, attention, mood, or motivation. Um, there might even be uh, procedures like ma magnetic pulses um, to stimulate re brain regions. So, um, and then again, um, things like luminosity for young kids, or of the, the games that we saw developed, where you can really start, start tailoring things for such a young plastic brain. Um, okay. And there's, there's just the brilliant brain that we're trying to shape. Um, and the fourth one is uh, data mad. Um, kind of biological tracking, all of the tools that are disposable, just and obviously are going to be in the near future in terms of tracking your baby and your child from every bowel and, and all the details. Should I start over? Um, okay, so uh, there should, you know, possibility is genomic read readouts, so parents can identify health problems before they happen. Sounds like a movie starring Tom Cruise. Uh, um, um, there also might be ingestibles, tiny swallowable sensors that will alert parents on their smartphone and whatever device we're going to have in 30 years that their child's, you know, met metabolic rate is off and they need to be eating, you know, more protein or absolutely no sugar. 
Um, so I'm not doing my clips. I'm not doing this right. That's, that's the data I'm at parenting. Um, so just in conclusion, this our future future baby, although barcodes I'm sure will be so outdated. Um, but it just, again, I just want to raise the questions of who are the human beings that we're raising now and are going to be roaming around the planet in 2050? Um, are they going to be big grown-up babies at age 25 still living in our homes without the emotional intelligence to make it on our own because we've created virtual bubbles for them? Or are, they, are we going to endow them with so much great skill with all of our technology that they'll actually, actually be superhumans? And I guess that would be the, um, the, you know, big 50 gazillion dollar question of how we use these technologies to, to raise the next generations. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I, with most of these things, I really admittedly am a Cassandra, and I, I, I think it's quite dangerous. Um, so there's obviously great temptation, especially if you know, you know, you have some genetic disorder in your family, and it's such a slippery slope. But. Um, no, as far as I know, it's, as far as I know, it doesn't, I, but it looks like it might be a possibility. There, I, th I believe something exists that kind of gives off, and again, other people may know more about this here, but sort of a low frequency signal, and they're, that they're trying to develop something, so it's really, yeah, yeah, and not give your kid cancer. <laughs> they're swallowing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was in uh, that was sort of uh, I would say maybe the 30s or something, and that was you know when people were living in tight quarters, apartments, and maybe so overwhelmed with their five other kids, and that that was a way to to let your baby play and get some fresh air while you right exactly so. I actually didn't hear all of that. Um, I actually don't know anything about it. Is that sort of uh, physically sort of, I think I very briefly touched on it. Uh, yeah, again, I, but it is, does seem to be one thing on the horizon from what I understand. On your children? I haven't tried it on my children. Okay, okay uh, yes, good question. Exactly. Exactly. Right, I, I, I think that you know if we still have plenty of parks and maybe we'll make sure we have, you know, keep our open spaces and and um, and do not put all these devices on kids because they're how are they ever going to learn what they're capable of or not? Um, th this is sort of similar, but what's interesting is wh I once wrote a blog about 
playgrounds, which have been made safer and safer and safer. Um, you know, those old merry-go-rounds, you can barely find those anymore, because I'm sure so many kids got concussions or those big slides. But what's happened is um, kids want to take risks. So on those safer playgrounds, they're still getting injured because they can't quite assess um, the danger level. So it's, it's counterintuitive, but it's sort of the same thing where we're not giving kids the normal things out there in the world to deal with. So they have no um, experience of, of how to interact with other people, what works, what doesn't work. They're really removed um, physically, emotionally. And, and I, I do think there's a great risk that we reduce kids' EQs, their empathy. Right, and uh, then are they truly functional, healthy, emotionally healthy, intelligent uh, human beings that, that can go out on their own and not live in your basement until they're 30, you know, so, so. okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie.